Hi there, this is David and welcome to my first impressions of Brave the Default 2 for the Nintendo Switch. I was a huge fan of the first two games in the series on the 3DS, as well as the spiritual prequel, The Four Heroes of Light on the DS, and it really is nice to see how the series has grown, expanded, and evolved over the course of these years. I personally just got this game for my birthday, but once I started, I really couldn't put it down. So let's dive deep into the good, bad, and the ugly, but mostly the good. The first thing that you're going to notice is that the graphics are absolutely beautiful, yet the integrity and graphical style of the originals has all been kept the same. It still feels like it's straight out of a storybook with beautiful cartoony characters, dark foreboding dungeons, a whimsical world map, and gorgeous expansive towns to explore full of people and their whiny side questy problems. I am a sucker for a good world map, in more ways than one. Give me a map full of treasures, characters wandering around, and secrets to find, and I'm a happy man! While you're out and about, you can slash your sword to get an advantage in an enemy encounter, as well as find minor treasures hidden in the tall grass. Also, as you continue your journey and enter new areas, more party chat will be added, similar to the Tales series. However, I found myself not using it all that often because, number one, it's not voiced, and number two, it just seemed to pause the action and drag everything out. I was laser focused on the exploration, battling, and job leveling, and I didn't really care about them chatting about finding fishermen's knives or how they signed a guest book. That being said though, I am glad that they included it, and they made it optional for those who would appreciate the lore. And speaking of the lore, let's get to the story. If you've played the previous games or even just Final Fantasy V, you know what you're getting into here. The story is very basic. The crystals are in peril. The world is veiled in darkness. The wind stops. The sea is wild. The earth begins to rot. All that jazz. And of course, you need the four warriors of light to restore the light to the crystals. We've all seen this before. It's bare bones, but it works. And honestly, I'm not complaining. It's nice to be able to pick up a game and not wonder what's going on or what I have to do. Keep it simple, stupid works here. The vast majority of all story scenes are voice acted and well done, and thankfully, the story doesn't really drag on forever either. In fact, within the first five minutes of starting up the game, you'll be out on the world map, exploring, grabbing treasures, and fighting monsters, which is a welcome reprieve because most JRPGs nowadays have like an hour-long introduction before you slowly begin to get tutorials about all the action. You don't really get your feet wet until like five hours in, but not here. It's simple, old school, and they just throw you to the wolves like in the good old days. In order to restore the crystals, you're going to need John classes, which are found from Asterix. And basically every single person that you meet is an Asterix holder. So of course, you're going to fight them sooner or later to receive their job class. You're going to be getting your standard jobs as well as some off-kilter ones but it's nice that you can mix and match with a main job, a sub job, and five support abilities from whatever other jobs that you want. The entire system is extraordinarily customizable and a ton of fun to fool around with. Encounters are thankfully on screen, and they'll either run away from you if you're too powerful or run towards you if they have the advantage. Monsters can also be chained together, which in theory could be dangerous, but for the most part, it's just a way to gather more experience and job points. While in battle, you'll notice that not only are there normal elemental vulnerabilities, but there's also weapon vulnerabilities. For example, an enemy might be weak against fire as well as staves and swords. So it's a very good idea to have a multitude of different weapons equipped to be able to exploit the weaknesses. The battles are fast and breezy, not only because of the fast forward feature, but really because of the tried and true namesake Brave and Default system. Just like the first games, you can kind of borrow turns from the future and attack up to four times, or you can default and save up turns. For the most part, you're just going to be braving and smacking the crap out of anything that gets in your way. However, if you try that during the boss fights, you are in for a rude awakening because they are hard. We're talking upwards of 10 to 15 minute fights here. You will be on the edge of your seat not knowing if you're going to be able to make it because they are just that difficult. However, I don't think that it's an unfair difficulty, because a little strategy does go a long way. 
That being said though, if it is too much, there is a difficulty selector where you can choose casual, normal, or hard. And as much as I wanted to be a dirty casual, I did play on normal. Many times I felt like I was a kid again, playing Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest 3 on the NES. It's so deliciously old school, but there are some great quality of life improvements here as well, such as auto healing in the menu, a quick save option, warp points in all the dungeons, and wagons that take you between towns free of charge. Not only that, everything is clearly marked. You're never really wondering what to do or where to go. All NPCs with the side quest have blue dialogue boxes. However, after doing about three different side quests, I was over it. They were all pretty obnoxious because they just devolved into back and forth busy work around town. And let's say somebody tells you to go out and fight some goblins. But whenever you kill the last one, you're not done. You have to go back into town to the quest giver for the reward. And that might seem like a small thing, but this one added extra step really adds up over the course of a long JRPG. Especially since they obviously went the quantity route for side quests instead of the quality route. Annoying NPCs and their side quests are swinging from the rafters. You can't turn a corner without some loser begging for your help. By the time that I hit the second town, I just decided to accept them, but not really go out of my way to complete them. If I finish the side quest, I finish it. But I'm not going to kill the pacing of the game just for the sake of some stupid side quests. Another thing that I found pretty annoying was the weight system. You can't just equip your characters with whatever you want because each item has its own weight and each character has their own weight limit. And if your character goes over their weight limit, all of their stats get reduced. This is so annoying, because you find yourself in the menus for way too long, and especially the shop menu, because you can't really tell if anything's better, because if it goes over your weight limit, even a better piece of equipment will show up with reduced stats. It just makes an otherwise fast-paced game come at a complete standstill as you sort with equipment and fool around with menus for a year and a day. On the bright side though, you'll never be lost, because a yellow diamond will always be on the map to show you where to go for story progression, and other various colored diamonds will appear in different locations that each signify where to go in order to complete specific side quests. As an adult who is to put games down for days and even weeks at a time, this is a blessing. And Square has also implemented a boat expedition quest which acts as a way to level up and gain treasures when the system is in sleep mode. So even whenever you're not playing the game, you're still kind of leveling up and making progress, which is such a kindness. Honestly, if you've ever wondered what it would be like if Final Fantasy V and Nino Kuni had a love child, then this is the game for you. I have had a blast with this so far, and I only got it like a couple of days ago. I can't say enough good things about it. To me, this could very well be my game of the year. Well, that's it for my impression of Bravely Default 2. What did you think of the game? Let me know in the comments. And if you like this video and what I do here on the channel, please follow me onto the Discord to chat and hang out, or consider supporting me on Patreon for exclusive videos and early access to my new top 10s. The link to them can be found in the video description. This has been David. If you like this, please like, comment, and subscribe, and have a good day.